God is good. All the time. And all the time. God is good. All right. Now let me explain the title just a little bit here. Has anyone heard this phrase before? Dogs don't bark at tombstones. Well, uh, when we lived in Searcy, uh, Tammy and I did a class at Harding. It was a couple of semesters on Christian counseling. And Joe Brumfield, who was the professor, was an awesome guy. He is an awesome guy. Uh, he would have uh, young families out to his uh, farm for the weekend, and, and he and his wife Linda were just wonderful fellows. But he had a saying, and this was his saying, dogs don't bark at tombstones. And basically what it meant was if Satan has you where he wants you, he doesn't have a need to afflict you. you know? So the analogy is dogs don't bark at tombstones, right? They don't bark at inactivity. They bark at like the mailman or a car that goes by. Or maybe it's your neighbor's dog who barks at you. We've got this old crotchety guy that has this miniature schnauzer <laughs> that walks through our neighborhood. And I know my compassion isn't shining through greatly here, Bruce, but I'll just be honest. I'll just confess. This, like if our cans are down to curb, he lets the dog get all tangled up in our cans. Or if one of the kid's friend's car parks out of the street, that dog is doing his business all over the car, right? <laughs> well, I thought I had my day last week out in the garage and that dog got loose and it came up our driveway and I thought now's my time to get that little schnauzer and it wouldn't come to me so I called it to me I was going to rescue it <laughs> <laughs> have you ever seen the movie Concussion with Will Smith now everyone here knows I am not a sports person I am not a sports fan <coughs> But this movie was phenomenal. Let's uh, let's run the trailer really quick, and then let me just in a, a thumbnail sketch. Let let me give you the plot line. But, but watch the trailer here. It's just a pretty recent movie. When I was a boy, heaven was here, and America was here. You could be anything. You could do anything. I never wanted anything as much as I wanted to be an American. Hearts here in Pittsburgh are broken over the loss of Hall of Famer Mike Webster, who had in recent years suffered from mental illness and slipped into financial ruin. Why does an apparently healthy, favorite son of this city die in disgrace at 50? I can tell something is wrong. In 25 years, I've never requested a test like this. What are you looking for? My God. I am the wrong person to have discovered this. If you don't speak for him, who will? Repetitive head trauma chokes the brain. It turns you into someone else. Tape, needle, vacuum, torridor, whatever it takes to keep them in the game. It's business. Get me a meeting with the commissioner. They don't want to talk to you. The NFL has known about the concussion issue for years. They're terrified of you. You're going to war with a corporation that owns a day of the week. This is bigger than they are. They have to listen to us now. Where is the science coming from? From nowhere. If you continue to deny my work, you're all men. Continue to die. I want you to say you made it all up. They're accusing you of fraud. Drop it, or they'll be doing your autopsy, Mr. Amalo. Doctor Amalo. You have no idea how bad this could get. I have to keep going. These men are not machines. We must honor our warriors. Do you understand the impact of what you are doing? Tell the truth. Tell the truth. I think you're gonna be an American hero. You're not even an American. That's even better. It's a great movie. So Will Smith plays this doctor who's from Nigeria, and he's a coroner for the University of Pittsburgh. And so the football player comes in, uh, and he's supposed to basically look at what he decides, I'm going to do a full autopsy, and then he orders a set of brain tests, and they say, well, that's not in the budget, so he pays $20,000 out of his own pocket 
to do all of these tests on the brain because he's wondering why would this guy's mind have deteriorated? There's no mental health history. There's no other history. And so basically, four or five NFL players have died or committed suicide, and, and he gets the chance to look at their brains, and, and he discovers that there's a problem from all the concussions, right? So the plot line of the story is he discovers this, and then he wants to bring the information to the NFL, and of course they embrace that, right? <laughs> no. Um, and so no one wants to hear the truth. And he basically has to leave before he, he is vindicated or justified. He has to leave the area. They just started a family, uh, built a house, and so he moves out to California to some poor little county out there to be a corner again. And then six years later, you know, okay, now people believe you. We're in the book of Nehemiah, and I don't know if everyone's familiar with Ezra and Nehemiah, but these are guys who are contemporaries. And actually, in Hebrew, if you have a Hebrew Bible with you, it's one book. They were, they were written as one volume. Kind of like in the New Testament, you may not remember this, but Luke and Acts were written as one volume. So really, it's Luke and Acts. Um, so Ezra and Nehemiah, they're contemporaries. And what's kind of interesting about Ezra and Nehemiah, it's written almost like a memoir. It's not like a, here's a doctrine, learn this truth, and you have to practice it. It's kind of this personal experience of what goes on here. And so, so they were written together. And so Nehemiah, he's a cupbearer. And a cupbearer, you know, is by the king's throne. And so whenever something comes for him to drink, you sample it to find out what? Is it poison or not? Um, and so he's Jewish, and he is uh, serving King Artaxerxes, who is in Susa, which today, if you were to look at a map of the Middle East, we're all pretty familiar with the Persian Gulf since the 90s. You know, it's kind of always on our radar. And we're really familiar with Iran because they're always in the news, and especially with the hundreds of billions of dollars that has just been released for them and, and the fact that they're not acting very kind these days. You know, we're always thinking about Iran. Well, Susa would be where modern-day Iran is, and so just a little bit north of the Persian Gulf. And so here, Nehemiah, uh, he, is, he is still serving in Susa, even though this is after the 70 years of the Jewish exile, and the people have been returned back to Jerusalem, he's still stuck in Susa for whatever reason. So while he's the cupbearer, uh, some friends come. He calls them brothers because it's a, it's a religious term. Some brothers come from Jerusalem, and he says, hey, how are things back in the homeland? Tell me about Jerusalem. Oh, Nehemiah. It's sad. You know, the people have been returned, but the city is still in ruins, you know. The temple, we, we read about that being re rebuilt in Ezra, but in Nehemiah, the walls have not been rebuilt. And the people have been back there for quite a while now, and, the, and it's just a shame. And so here's Nehemiah. He's standing before the king, and the queen is there too. And, and he's just kind of, he's moping, which in that day and age could get you killed. You had to be on your best behavior. You had to have on the happy face whenever you're around the king. And so just to mope and to pout for the king could be very risky. And so the king says, hey, what's up with you, Nehemiah? You know, I know you're not sick. This has got to be a matter of the heart. What's wrong? And so Nehemiah prays kind of this silent prayer. Basically, you know, he's probably asking for guidance from God. He doesn't record what the prayer is, but I pray to God so it's silent. It's in his mind, right? Well, let me tell you what, king. Man, my, my homeland is, it's just the walls are destroyed, and it's a shame that the city's in a shameful position. And the king says, well, what, what do you want? What, what is it that you'd like to do? Well, I think I need to go back home and rebuild the walls. Well, what do you need? Well, king, here's what I need. Write some letters so I can get lumber, material, uh, permission to cross over here. I need your help. So the king gives it to him, and he goes back to Jerusalem, which is quite a trek. You were to look at a map from Iran back in those days, because you can't go right across the desert. You kind of got to go up and back down. So he goes back to Jerusalem. But he doesn't tell anyone what's going on. He doesn't let the cat out of the bag. He doesn't say, hey, God's put it on my heart to rebuild the walls and remove this shame and to make things safe and to secure the city and make it a city again. So he goes back, and he's there a couple of days. And so one night he goes out just to check out the city walls at night. And so everything has kind of been destroyed from the Babylonian captivity over um, 
in, in the past. And as he, as he walks around, you know, he just sees how bad things are. And some of the rubble's so bad, he's got to get off of his donkey or horse or whatever he's riding just, just to get through the rubble. And so then he's going to tell the people. Right? Now I'm, I'm ready to tell the people, this is what we need to do. I believe this is what God wants us to do. I think this is what's best to do. And so we'll get to the passage now that Alyssa read. So if you would, uh, open to Nehemiah. And, and if you're in a Bible, and I, I think pretty much everyone's out there. Well, Mike's got a Bible. Everyone else seems like they're, well, we've got a couple Bibles. If you're on your cell phone, it's easy to find. If you're looking in the Bible, it's not exactly where you'd expect to find it because it's not late, late in your Old Testament. It's, it's earlier back. So Nehemiah chapter 4. And, and this kind of gets to the heart of the matter for today's discussion. Now, when Sanballat heard that we were building the wall, he was angry and greatly enraged. And he jeered at the Jews. And he said in the presence of his brothers in the army of Samaria, Ha! What are these feeble Jews doing? Will they restore it for themselves? Will they sacrifice? Will they finish up in a day? Will they revive the stones out of the heaps of rubbish and burned ones at that? Tobiah, the Ammonite, was beside him. And he said, ha, yes, ha, what are they building? If a fox goes up on it, he will break down their stone wall. And then now Nehemiah breaks in. He says, hear, O God, for we are despised. Turn back their taunt on their own heads, right? And give them up to be plundered in a land where they are captives. Let them know what we've been through, right? Do not cover their guilt. and Do not let their sin be blotted out from your sight. For they have provoked you to anger in the presence of your builders. So, verse 6, right? So, so we built the wall. And the wall was joined together to half its height. For the people had a mind to work. They're in it. They're behind it. So, so they're, they're, they're halfway up, right? But verse 7 says, When Sam Ballot and Tobiah and the Arabs and the Ammonites and the Ashdodites heard that the repairing of the walls of Jerusalem was going forward and that the breaches were beginning to be closed, they were very angry. And they all plotted together to come in and fight against Jerusalem and cause confusion in it. We prayed to our God and set a guard as a protection against them day and night. So they just depend on their own strength, and they didn't just depend on God. We prayed, but we also made some provisions here. And verse 10 says, In Judah it was said, The strength of those who bear the burdens is failing. There's too much rubble. Oh man, this job is so overwhelming. We can't get done, right? By ourselves, we'll not be able to rebuild the wall. And our enemies have said, right, uh, they will not know it or see it when we come among them and kill them and stop the work. Verse 12 says, At that time the Jews who lived near came from all directions and said to us ten times, You must return to work. You must return to work. you, you got to get this done. And so verse 13 says, So in the lowest parts of the space behind the wall, in the open places, I stationed people by their clans with their swords, their spears, and their bows. And I looked around, and I rose, and I said to the nobles and the officials and, and to the rest of the people, Do not be afraid of them. Remember the Lord who is great and awesome. And fight for your brothers, your sons, your daughters, your wives, your homes. Sounds like a halftime speech during the Super Bowl. And the coach is in the locker room. Don't give up. Don't give up. Don't give up. You can do this. And from this passage, there's a very real life lesson. And, and that is you're going to face opposition you're going to face resistance. You're going to be manipulated by wicked people whenever you pursue a good endeavor. And that's true enough to tweet people. That's, that's, that is reality. Anytime you want to pursue a good endeavor, you are going to face opposition. There will be people who will stand up and try to break your will. Um, bullies are going to threaten. People will come out of the woodwork trying to interfere with any worthwhile effort. Anytime that you try to establish order from within the chaos of the world around you, there is going to be someone who is going to stand up as a naysayer. They're going to try to bully you. They're going to try to intimidate you. They're going to try to uh, give you some type of resistance. It could be something as simple as if you want to put a fence up on your property. And if that's not a cultural cliche, how many times have you heard of someone trying to put up a fence 
and the neighbor saying you're too close to my property or you know there's some there's something going on there it could be something more substantial like as an adult uh, maybe you know you know someone that wants to go back to school they, they want to better themselves um, someone you know starting a soup kitchen I don't know what it is something where you're making a stand for righteousness use your imagination you fill in the blank think of something where someone's trying to do something good and I promise you you're going to face opposition and why is that now, I read this passage and I, and I asked myself why is it that people want to interfere Whenever you're doing something good, you're bettering yourself, you're trying to better your community, you're trying to do something for your family, and, and people want to silence you. They want to interfere with you doing something good. So number one, I think it's jealousy. That's pretty simple. Maybe they hadn't thought of the idea at, at first, and so they're jealous that, that you thought of it. You know, maybe uh, they weren't brave enough. Isn't that not interesting? When you do something that's great and worthwhile and someone else wishes that they had done it, but now they're jealous because they weren't as strong as you, they don't embrace that. They don't congratulate you. What do they do? They try to interfere, sabotage, get in the way. And, and sometimes people are jealous because now they feel marginalized. Because you're doing something wonderful, it's getting attention, and you're at the center of attention for doing something good and worthwhile, and, and no one sees me, hey, I'm over here. Oh, yeah, well, they're really not that great of a person. Let me tell you. All right, they, get, they get jealous. So, number one, I think people interfere because they're jealous. Number two, I think some people see it as a threat to the accomplishments that they've made in life. Maybe they've done something good or something substantial or worthwhile, and you doing the good thing that you're trying to do makes them feel threatened. And then thirdly, I think people interfere because it stretches. I don't even know if you're talking about this in church or not. Because there's a sacred part of church culture called the comfort zone. <laughs> you know what I found out about ministry? You never know where the landmines are until you step on them. <laughs> right? So you don't know what's going to trigger a reaction in people until you, until you go there. And anytime you stretch someone's comfort zone, oh, they are going to protect that ruthlessly. And so sometimes if you're doing something that's good, that's worthwhile, that's noteworthy, you might be stretching someone's comfort zone and they may not react the way that you would hope. So here comes the big question, though. And I was trying to think through, okay, why is it that people interfere? And I think, you know, jealousy, feeling threatened, their comfort zone, that, that all made sense to me. And then I came up with this huge question in my mind. How can we tell the difference between someone that's a naysayer, maybe that's uh, trying to interfere with our good plans, you know, they're, they're trying to sabotage us, you know, the, the person that um, is, is maybe, you know, the hostile opposition. How can we tell the difference between that and wise counsel or valid concerns? How can you, how can you separate that? How can you separate the two? Because, you know, is someone coming to you with some good advice, or are they really just trying to manipulate you? And here's what I came up with. If they belittle your goals, oh, that's, that's a stupid idea. If they belittle your goals and bash your character, then it's not wise counsel. It's not someone that has advice for you. But if they can affirm your goals, hey, that's worthwhile and yet be objective, it might be a voice of reason that you might want to listen to. So if someone says that's stupid and you're being selfish, what does that tell you? They're, they're not there for the right reason. Well, that's so stupid. Oh, I can't believe you would take time to do that. That's, that's not the voice of reason. But if someone says, wow, man, you know what? That sounds really awesome. I think God has gifted you in that area, but you know it's going to be tough. And have you stopped to consider this? Then maybe you should say, oh, wow, I hadn't really thought it through all the way. Thank you for the advice. So there will be times in life where it is someone who is just a manipulator and they're just trying to crush your spirit and destroy what you're doing. But then sometimes it could be a loving, concerned voice. Um, and so I know for me, for example, when 
we made the step to partner with Newsom, I didn't just step into it blindly. Uh, Tammy and I thought about it, prayed about it, uh, but I sought out some mentors of mine that I've known through the years and said, hey, what do you think about this? Whenever you're trying to do something, I think it's good to have insight, but you also have to be able to uh, be able to discern and to, to sift out the hostile voices. So, okay, we know why people interfere. We know there's times where we can separate the naysayers from the cheerleaders. But how do you find the strength to continue? Nehemiah is up against a huge challenge here. Uh, and in fact, there's part of the story when, while they're working, you know, they got their trowel in one hand and their spear or their sword in the other, and they're, they're still working hard. So he, he's up against some hostile opposition. He's up against a, a huge obstacle to rebuild the wall. How, how does he find the strength to continue? And I would say probably the same way that you will. When you find something that's worthwhile to pursue that is a challenge that faces obstacles, uh, number one, for Nehemiah, I, I believe that he knew, he knew what he was doing was good and necessary for the good of the many. In other words, it was bigger than him. It was beyond just him. He doesn't even live in Jerusalem. He lives in, in Susa. And so he knew this was necessary for the safety, the security, uh, the health of Jerusalem. But more importantly, I believe he knew it's what God wanted. He trusted this is what God wanted. So his identity is wrapped up as, I'm a child of Jerusalem, even though he doesn't live in Jerusalem. And he probably never lived in Jerusalem. He probably spent his whole life, you know, as part of the generation of after the exile, because he's he's born after the exile. But he never lives in Jerusalem. But that's where his heart is, his identity is. I'm, I'm a child of this is my homeland. This is my this is where my patriotic loyalties lie. But he believes it's what God wanted. Now here's the really interesting part. If you think about the story, if you've not read Nehemiah, I hope that you'll read it because then you can see how in 54 or 56 days, I forget what it is, they, they actually get the walls rebuilt. Uh, and they actually accomplish quite a bit. Here's the interesting part for me. Nehemiah was a nobody. He's a cup bearer. He's disposable. Drink the cup for the king. Right? If it's poison, so what? Let's get Nehemiah's cousin in here. Next! Right? He's politically he's a nobody. Now as the story evolves, it seems like he becomes a type of governor of, of the area. And he accomplishes quite a bit, but he's he's really not in any special position when he starts off, and that's vastly important for us. Because so many times in this life, you've got this great ambition or this goal. You see a project or a ministry or something that needs to be done, and what's the first thing? Satan plants in your mind. Who are you? You're a nobody. You don't have a status. You don't have a position. You're nobody of influence. What could you honestly do? Who's Nehemiah? He's a cupbearer. He tastes for poison. His job every day, his job description is go to work so that you might die so that someone else doesn't have to. Sounds like parenting, right? No, okay. Um, Anyway, so he's not really anybody. And yet he accomplishes so much. And he motivates the people. And they rebuild the wall. And he draws the people together. They weren't even ready to do the project. It wasn't like they wrote him a letter, hey, come and fix this problem. He saw the problem and he went and fixed it. And I guess the punchline of the story is, uh, for Nehemiah and for us, doing the right things for the right reasons, uh, it's going to leave scars. And whenever you try to do something right, you're going to walk away from it oftentimes with a limp. You're going to walk away with scars. So doing the right things for the right reasons can leave scars, but then again, I think that the cross did too, didn't it? 